what is your understanding of addiction and what got you there? And maybe Jan, if you want to start us off here and then we can move to Steve. Sure, yeah. So what got me there was, I guess, early on, like 40 years ago, I started working with a group of young women who were incest survivors. And they were describing these uh, behaviors that they were engaging in uh, that became addictive. They were self-harming. They became addictive. And some of them were easy to kind of get, you know, in terms of drinking or doing a lot of drugs that numbed the system. Mm-hmm. Although we didn't talk about the dorsal vagus back then. That was, that was something you gave us, Steve, much later. But we did understand numbing and we understood flooding. And eventually I began to understand that that was the autonomic nervous system. But what, what was puzzling to me was that the behaviors they were describing, like cutting the body, mm-hmm. uh, things like, Uh, banging into walls, engaging in unsafe sex, things that were harder to kind of figure out what what that was all about. And the traditional psychiatric system was, you know, diagnosing them with borderline personality disorder and basically wanting to basically get rid of them. So uh, that didn't sit well with me uh, in my feminist days um, still. And so I went searching Mm -hmm. and, you know, this is what I outlined in my book and, and, um, And what I began to realize, and when I eventually heard you, Steve, talk in 2012, was that really addictions, the most powerful way to really understand them is through the autonomic nervous system. And when when I then had the chance to connect with Steve Nile through my friends, uh, Serge Pringle, our mutual friend in 2018, and then we started to talk and I said, you know, I think addictions shift you from one state to the other and back again from this sympathetic state Mm. into a dorsal numbing and also from numbing into back into sympathetic and cutting was one of those things that seemed to be Mm. able to do both in the body and Steve you know is when you you said to me well I've always seen addictions as state regulation strategies Mm -hmm. and I went wow yes that's what fit that's what fit for me so from my perspective, I'm, I'm basically this, uh, let's say, observer of this world of that has all these patho- pathologizing terms. And I am basically come from this with a, a different template, a different perspective. And that perspective is, can I identify underlying mechanisms mm-hmm. that explain the processes that are expressed as pathology? And the issue with addiction, since it's not hasn't been in my personal space, um, it just to me appeared to be such an obvious, overt strategy to try to regulate biobehavioral state. So we can call it autonomic state, but we can really just kind of use this global term, biobehavioral state. We change how our internal body feels, and we're changing our own behaviors, and we're changing how we react to them. the issue with it is that it doesn't change the flexibility of the nervous system. This is really where we start to learn a lot, that if we could manipulate our state efficiently and effectively with pharmaceuticals, we would be in a way replacing the dynamics of the nervous system. And we can't do that because the nervous system is really a second to second adjustment and what we're doing is numbing and engaging. But if we stand back and remember, uh, I'm a child of the 60s, Jan, Jan so just remember. So the but drug so culture. Am I. <laughs> <laughs> You're just older than me a bit. Yeah, but... <laughs> a bit, a bit. But yeah. <laughs> the, the drug culture was all about getting up and getting down. And yeah. But then the cost of that was seen that the body could not be manipulated like a machine because it had its own learning tools within it. And it would literally either nullify the pharmaceutical, the drug, or it would amplify it, or it would prime it, or it would basically create dysregulation. So even within a pharmaceutical world where, let's say, medical pharmaceuticals, where people go for psychiatric help and they want to have certain pharmaceuticals to use to regulate their state, It's not a simple, I'll take this and everything will be fine. Uh -uh. The body processes it and it doesn't always work the same over time. The bottom line is we did reach the same conclusion 
and that was it's uh, addiction is a strategy to regulate one state and from my perspective it's not a very efficient or effective one it in the long term i think yeah. short term we and this is where i think psychiatry and you know pharmaceutical manipulation of biobehavioral state has a, has a place in the short term it can save people's lives yeah yeah i agree i think there is a place for for those meds at certain times mm -hmm. and i think you know steve the the thing that i love what really resonated so much uh in in reading your work initially too was that to understand that these behaviors were adaptive yeah. in the context in which they occurred in which yeah. they were created right yeah. and that changes the model from yeah. a, a kind of pathologizing model into a model that really recognizes the wisdom of the body yeah it leads to the next step and that is respecting that wisdom and yes. uh, and literally i use the term a different form of co-regulation we talk about co-regulation as between people but really a co-regulation between our intentional awareness our our awake brain and our literally the brain that is regulating our bodily states and we know that when we get shifted into a survival state the intentional brain takes a back seat you know yeah, yeah and and that's why people have arguments that's why they fight that's why all kinds of things happen and that's why they can't in a sense get control over it because it doesn't have the same balance the biobehavioral survival circuits have a different uh, let's say amplification function they're powerful and the intentionality uh, can't rein it in even though and that's part of the whole history of addiction where we literally blame people for being victimized by their own survival uh circuits so they're yes. saying yeah. exactly that's really really important to say again that we blame people right yeah. mm -hmm. for for things that they're doing that are just strategies to try to survive and yeah. it doesn't minimize the damage the damage yeah. is enormous to self and to to others yeah but it really creates and i think as trauma therapists this has you know it's had a huge impact in our world right because yeah. in the world of addiction not just trauma but in addiction mm -hmm. because so many horrible things do happen in addictive yeah. states right and yeah. the, i think sometimes the worst the hardest part of healing from addiction is not the actual addiction it's for a lot of folks especially if they've been at it for years it's what they've done that has harmed themselves and others mm -hmm. and they can't face it because of the guilt so yeah. they can't engage in the healing process so your are you know the work of really recognizing the wisdom of the body mm -hmm. and through the felt sense is liberating people from no, that horrible yeah. shame and guilt let me add one other part to it so as you and i start to get into a dialogue and wrote a paper together and did. Uh, yes and you know, i <laughs> was pushing this whole notion of a strategy of state regulation yeah. i was bouncing some of these ideas uh, uh i was bouncing them off of people that, that i know in the addiction area and what they were trying to basically say to me they said yes and meaning that, yes there's a state regulation but there's something else that occurs and what they were describing they were describing like an identity to your drug of choice this relationship yes. but what they were really if i deconstruct what they're saying there was a top-down association being built on a literally a learned uh familiarity with what a drug did now what i want to expand on that is our nervous system is kind of like a uh, it, it has a little bit of let's say spectrum features to it okay it says if i'm familiar with the sequence of events even if they're not always pleasant i know where i'm going yeah but yeah. if there's a violation of expectancy i am in chronic threat i can't walk into that room so you have within addiction uh, behavioral streams or adjustments to what they already know are negative ones but they know what it is mm -hmm. and so there are these bottom-up survival triggers that we try to regulate without good toolkits we take a drug uh the drug 
dampens this or, or numbs it does one of two things it yeah. puts us into a pot this is the part not being and having an addiction history yeah and i start learning that you know people want to be numb yeah <laughs> let, okay so let there's some things that you you may not know about my history uh Probably. when i uh, yeah well when i was 22 <laughs> end of my first year in graduate school i worked as a prison guard Oh my God! And, no, and, I didn't know that. I worked. I worked in the county workhouse, which was loaded with the young people who were uh, oh. drug addicts and the older people who were alcoholics, and there was oh. a cultural distinction between them. But they were. It was a time when heroin was actually pretty big within this community, yeah. and the comments that I heard. These were recently young people in their twenties, including oh. some people who were in there. I had actually gone to high school with, which was kind of this interesting interface of who's on what side, oh, but, God. but it was kind of this saying, why would you want to be numb? Yeah. And the issue is at that point, I really knew very little about basically adversity histories. So mm. if you have an adversity history, you know, one of your dreams is not to feel. Yeah, to be numb you. so you start seeing that the history of the person impacts on the state that they view as being positive and then they build associations of getting into that state yeah so yeah, it, it to me it was just remarkable about it and then again the other thing was in the world of being let's say a young a young a young adult alcohol was always into the culture but yeah. I, the notion of alcoholic abuse was very different than a social drink. Mm -hmm. And the fact that when you could start seeing people's behaviors shift ra radically yeah. as they took more alcohol, you start seeing, and some of them were using it to get into those states because they felt too timid uh, and they wanted to be social. So they want yes, literally. Yeah, yeah. I I think the actually the the metaphor was to lift the lid off the id. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a, okay. So that's a Freudian concept, but yeah, that's yeah, yeah. really what it was yes. doing. It yeah. was taking away the constraints of this most primitive uh, biological system in our body to express its animal nature, mm -hmm. and this is what a lot. If you go back to the '60s, this was even a type of metaphor that. If we remove the constraints of society, yeah. Yeah, that's true. that nature would express itself and that nature would be beautiful. Yeah. Whether or not it would be beautiful becomes another discussion. But yeah. the the part that I wanted, wanted to really say is, as I was literally, as, an, as a young adult in, in you know, graduate school and social behavior, and then working in the prison, you start seeing extremes but what you start learning is that for many people who had a problem let's use a term a substance problem there was a reliance on that as a primary state regulator yeah. and that was really replacing what social behavior was supposed to do so in our own yeah, development totally. our own development co-regulation interaction with another is the primary way in which we effectively, I say, but not necessarily the primary, the most efficient way that we regulate our state. And yeah. if people don't have that accessibility for co-regulation, then they have a vulnerability to start using external methods. If you're interested in seeing the full session and 34 others like it, you might wanna check out the Holistic Recovery Summit. This is a revolutionary free online conference which brings together 35 world-leading clinical psychologists, researchers, and practitioners who will share with you their best practices for mind, body, social, and spiritual approaches to addiction treatment, enabling you to be at the forefront of evidence-based care. With a lineup including Stephen Porges, Janina Fisher, Ian McGilchrist, Pat Ogden, Anna Lemke, Stephen Hayes, Richard Schwartz, and 28 others, this really is a once in a lifetime learning opportunity. The best bit is it's 100% free to attend live and you can do so from the comfort of home. You'll also be able to upgrade to your recordings and certification pass after registration, although this is entirely optional. For more information, please check out the sign up link in the description.